All right, my friends, and welcome to a special bonus episode here, the Red Delta Project podcast, taking a fundamental approach to fitness to give you more power, control, and freedom over your lifestyle. I am here with a new guest, Ryan Sadelak. He is the creator of Minus the Gym. I stumbled across his socials several months ago, YouTube, Instagram, all of his stuff is down below. Highly, highly recommend checking out his stuff because not only is it about calisthenics training and plant-based nutrition, but it's also very much about the freedom, the independence, and the ability to take more charge and control over your health and fitness destiny in the real world. So I had to get him on here so he can share his wisdom and tips with us. So without further ado, Ryan, welcome to the Red Delta Project podcast. Thanks, Matt. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Excellent. So give us the, the general uh, history spiel on how everything developed for you so we kind of get a foundational base on where you're coming from. Oh, boy. Well, it actually goes all the way back to my childhood, believe it or not. Um, I ate a lot of junk food. Just, you know, I, I was not a healthy kid. I wasn't very active. And I wound up obese when I was about, gosh, I think I was like eight or 10 years old when I was really I was really overweight and I was overweight all the way until high school, my first year of high school. And I decided to really do something about it. So that's when I started learning about fitness and nutrition. I was only about 14 or so. And it stuck with me. Like I fell in love with it. I ended up really turning my health around. I graduated high school, complete opposite. Like people didn't recognize me. I was in such good shape. Um, they thought I was a jock. They thought maybe I played football or something you know, like an athlete, but I didn't. I just worked out and I, I was actually a musician. I played guitar. That was my hobby. And, um, you know, went to college, you know, kept working out and everything. And uh, I actually went to college for computer science. I pursued something different. I didn't pursue fitness or exercise science. But when I got to be 25 years old, the whole time I kept working out, you know, I kept lifting weights. That was my thing. I was into bodybuilding. And I was eating the traditional bodybuilding diet, which back then they recommended like five or six meals a day, lots of chicken breast and broccoli and brown rice and meals like that. Um, lots of lean protein, animal-based protein. When I was 25, I was diagnosed with really high blood pressure, stage two hypertension. And my doctor said, like, he couldn't believe it. He said, um, you have the blood pressure of a 70 year old man, I think is what he said, and you're, you're 25. And I was like, okay, well, how did this happen? You know, I've been exercising, I've been eating just the way I was told in all the fitness books, like, why did this happen? And he couldn't answer it. He said it was genetics. So long story short, a friend of mine, at the time, he had just graduated from school for dietetics. And he introduced me to plant based nutrition. So I kind of, at that point, I took a break from fitness, because I want to get my health under control. I didn't want to be at risk of a stroke when I was working out. Um, I had high readings. My blood pressure was like 180 over 100 at times. It was extremely high for my age. Uh, I started eating plant-based, like 100% vegan, as they call it, but I don't really like that word. Um, just to focus on whole food, plant-based, um, followed all the rules. And within three months, my blood pressure regulated. And that actually, in my mid to late 20s, is when I found calisthenics. Because I wanted to get back into fitness, but I didn't want to get sucked into that bodybuilding craze again. Um, I wanted to keep it, you know, I want to do something different and keep it healthy. And that's when I saw people on YouTube. Um, gosh, like I, Calisthenics Kings, I think his name is Hit Richards was out there on YouTube at the time. And just some of the stuff he was doing, like the handstand pushups and, you know, the scorpion handstand pushups. Uh, tiger bend and all that I was just blown away I was like I want to try to learn how to do that so I started doing the basics um, that's actually when I got certified as a personal trainer as well started going into a new direction and yeah I haven't looked back um, I think body weight fitness and really the the plant-based diet that's what I kind of did with minus the gym is I combined the two and said hey these really work well together you know the the, the plant-based diet keeps you healthy keeps you lean um, you get enough protein, really, a lot of people doubt that. And I, I think it's a great marriage of two awesome things. I love this story because it, it mirrors so much of my own experience as well. I think a lot of guys, especially when they start to get into fitness, 
uh, kind of like as a macro lesson from our, our fitness culture as a whole. It's like, well, what do you do to get in shape? It's like, train like a bodybuilder. You eat like a bodybuilder. You do everything like a bodybuilder does because that's kind of what we got exposed to, especially in the 80s and 90s growing up. It's, oh, yeah. That's what you saw everywhere. And it was also a little bit of a different way to think about things because like you growing up, like I never saw myself as an athlete ever. Like I was never very good at sports or anything, but nevertheless, I wanted to be in shape. So it's like, well, what do you do if you want to exercise, but you don't want to be necessarily a athlete practicing a sport? Well, you bodybuilding type stuff is kind of the way to go. And that's all we really had growing up. That's those were the options. But now we've got so many more options and it's mirroring exactly the same thing. Late 20s for me, I found calisthenics when I was almost 30 and stuff. And it's like, oh, there's another way to do this. This is fantastic. Yeah. So was it a quick thing for you, like a quick transition to calisthenics? Or was it something that kind of came on gradually for you? Oh, it was a quick transition because I didn't want to return to weights. Um, I knew if I did that. I would go back to the caloric surplus, trying to put on mass and everything. And I just didn't want to go down that rabbit hole again. Um, so I embraced it. I just embraced the basics. And what I loved about it was, and I'm not sure if this, this might've been a combination of eating plant-based and switching to calisthenics, but I found that my recovery was faster. I could really go hard with the body weight stuff and still just like, you know, every day I was working out like six, even seven days a week sometimes. Um, keep in mind I was in my twenties, so it was a little different, <laughs> but like, I, I really felt like I recovered really fast. Um, and I, sometimes I wouldn't even do split training. I would just do full body, whatever I felt like, and just really focus on mastering the basics. And I, I dove into it head first. Lo yeah. The very, very cool. I like how you just kind of, uh, made that happen very, very quickly as a quick love affair. So if someone yeah. was looking to make such a transition like they've been doing the bodybuilding thing and the heavy lifting and eating like crazy uh, for a while i mean that takes quite a toll on body and mind and lifestyle and i think that's one of the things that really uh, hits a lot of, especially guys is it's like great for several years but man that really takes its toll on everything and uh, you look at uh, a lot of a lot of guys who uh, you know, really get into that lifestyle. And it's not something that is healthy in the long run. So if someone's starting to burn out on that, like they've been doing that sort of approach for several years, and they're starting to get some wear and tear on their body and their lifestyle and stuff, what is some of the advice that you would recommend to someone who's curious about trying these other approaches? Well, I would say, okay, if you're feeling burnt out, and you're curious about this stuff, I would first take a look at your lifestyle, you know, your diet, um, how much caffeine are you consuming? I know my pre-workouts had caffeine and I ditched that. I still do drink a little bit of, you know, coffee, but um, I found personally that caffeine in my pre-workout was actually detrimental and I, I don't recommend it. So take a look at your lifestyle. What are you consuming? What are you ingesting? I don't recommend a 100% plant-based diet for everybody. But um, if you've been eating the bodybuilding, you know, caloric surplus diet, you know, bulk cut, bulk cut for years, I think it can be good to sort of cleanse, you know, maybe do three months of plant-based and then reintroduce animal products and see how you like it, see how you feel. Um, you know, may maybe you land on just fish, fish and eggs. A lot of people land on like a Mediterranean diet. That's a really healthy diet. It's great for longevity. So taking that stance, looking at your lifestyle first, uh, in terms of fitness, for me, embracing calisthenics was all about, I mean, it was, it was psychological as well, because I let go of that idea of being big. And my physique is different. My body is smaller right now. I used to weigh 205 when I was lifting weights. Um, and I was a pretty lean 205, maybe 12 or 13% body fat. Uh, since then, in, in calisthenics, I've gotten as low as like 178, 180, um, you know, much much leaner actually at times, but um, it's, I'm not as big and it's because I'm not focusing on pushing heavy weights and I'm, I'm more focused on moving my body in the most efficient way possible. I got really obsessed with handstands, for example, and handstand when you do it properly is about stacking your joints. You actually don't want to be working hard when you're holding a proper handstand. So sometimes in bodyweight fitness, it's not about 
just tons of reps and sets and building up your body. It's about moving. It's about movement. And it's really psychological. So I encourage people to think of it that way. Like you're going to take a new approach to fitness that's better for you. It's a more natural way to move. And it's not just about big muscles. I like this, this approach that you have of it's about movement. Because if you look at a lot of very classic gym-based type of exercise, you'll actually notice that there's not a lot of movement going on. Uh, like yes. it, it, coming from uh, the, the history of being a cardio junkie, like particularly mountain biking and stuff, you look at the range of motion and the movement patterns of a lot of cardio, it's actually relatively small ranges of motion. There's not, there's a lot of volume of movement, but there's not a lot of types and ranges of motion. And then when we get into particularly like especially heavier stuff, you know, bench press and, um, you know, squats and stuff, you find people, they're not going through a very big range that they could go with. And I found too, that when I got into calisthenics, I was starting to really explore movement patterns that brought me out of these very confined boxes that I was limiting myself to, not because of, of a weight necessarily, but just because the exercise didn't necessarily require a lot of range. And so with calisthenics, it's like, oh, this is squatting deep means. Oh, this is what really packing the shoulders or getting a full range push up or pull up means. Like, wow, this is a totally different thing. And I totally agree where you get more movement. Oh, it's such a game changer for the health of your body as a whole. Mm -hmm. Yeah, proprioception too is another one. Like you don't, you don't think about where your limbs are and where your body is in space when you're doing bicep curls and things like that. But when it comes to calisthenics, I also got into primal movement quite a bit, just doing like quadrupedal stuff on the floor. Uh, it's all about proprioception and, and just like, you know, being aware of where your body is in space. And, and that's something that I think is really crucial in fitness, but we tend to neglect, especially in the bodybuilding realm and the, the weightlifting realm. I couldn't agree more. It's, yeah. it's something that I think, especially again, like coming from my history, like I wasn't an athlete. I wasn't in shape. And I think one of the, not so much secrets out there in our fitness culture, but I think one of the things that isn't being addressed enough is the fact that a lot of people who later on in life develop a very impressive physique or even impressive skills with calisthenics and stuff, you find that they started off with an athletic foundation or history. They were a gymnast. They used to wrestle. They used to do all this stuff. So they developed, especially at an early age, this proprioception and kinesthetic awareness and stuff. And so when they started to say, oh, I'm going to learn to do handstands. I'm going to try to build some muscle. Their body was like, yeah, we know how to do all this. But for guys who didn't have that kind of history, it's they're coming to the, the table with a lot less in their toolbox to be able to effectively train, even though on paper, it's like I do the leg press, I'm doing barbell curls, okay, I'm doing the same thing. Why am I not getting the results? It's like, it's because of the lack of movement skills that isn't there for that foundation. So if you notice that improving these skills and the ability, the uh, proficiency of using your body is not only in a health wise, but also just in your ability to be strong and to use your body in an effective way. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. And it's funny when you mentioned um, that a lot of these people who are, you know, later in life, they're doing these impressive skills and stuff in their 30s. It's you find out when you look into them or you watch interviews with them that, oh, they've been doing martial arts since they were 10 or they were a gymnast or a break dancer or all these things as a teenager. And it's like, oh, that's so when, when you're like us and you get into it later in life, even just in your 20s, it's like you, you've missed that window and it, it's much different. Yeah. So I, I totally agree. Um, another thing worth mentioning, I think, is like with the, the bodybuilding um, movements that I think it, we're talking about limited range of motion. I think they also lack functional crossover into normal everyday life. Like when you look at a bench press, um, you're, you're, the bench is supporting you and you're just pressing primarily with your pecs and your delts and your triceps, right? And you're doing that for so many reps. It's like where in life, even throughout human evolution, would we have like lied down on the ground and just pushed something for, you know, it, it doesn't make any sense. But when you look at the push up, well, now you're maintaining your center of gravity. You're engaging your core, your quads, your calves, everything's engaged, right? 
and it's a it becomes a total body exercise essentially and then if you start crawling in that position now it makes sense now oh that's why you know you should be doing your pushes in a more prone position right so there's this functional crossover in calisthenics that i really like and when you start exploring other modalities of body weight fitness it's like oh that it gets more primal and that's that's what i'm really into lately yep so outside of like, we got the basic calisthenics, you got push-ups, you pull up squats, lunges, all that sort of thing. What are some of the other things that you have gotten a lot of benefit from that you feel just isn't very popular in the calisthenics world? Sure. Yeah. Um, believe it or not, handstand. Um, I know it is popular, right? Because uh, there's a lot of videos of people doing handstand push-ups and stuff. And the flair is like, wow. But whenever I make a video on YouTube, about handstands, I'm surprised at how small of a percentage of my audience tunes in. And I think a lot of that is that they're just not interested. They're like, well, I'm, that's not my goal right now. I don't wanna do that. But what I personally found is that when I pursued the handstand, it was a huge undertaking. I felt like I could not even get upside down for the life of me, even against the wall, I couldn't kick up. And I, they, I had tight hamstrings and that was preventing me from kicking up my leg. I mean, I had so much work to do and it was a long journey. It was about eight months before I was holding a, you know, wavy, crooked handstand. So it was a huge journey. But if you look at everything that I accomplished in achieving the handstand, everything in terms of strength, mobility and flexibility, balance, I mean, there's, there's so many facets of fitness that were involved in that. I think just achieving a straight handstand is a totally underrated skill in calisthenics. Uh, don't even think about handstand push-ups or, you know, some other crazy skills that, that it might lead to one arm handstand and things like that. Just focus on that, that straight handstand that I think is underrated. And then there's other movements that I think are overrated, like muscle ups. I know a lot of people love muscle ups, but um, it's, I don't know, it's great because it's a push and pull movement combined, but it, you know, kipping is, is often involved and stuff. And it's just, I, I think there's, there's better things you can work on in calisthenics. And believe it or not, the basics, um, I think basics are underrated too. I think so many people, they kind of see the flair and they just want to do that. I get these young guys messaging me on Instagram saying, hey, I want to learn the planche in three months. I'm like, dude, don't even, <laughs> like, I'm sorry, not, not to crush your dream, but like, you know, you're going to kill your wrists if you try to do that. So they get obsessed with the flair. And I think it's like the basics are so great. And just some of those intermediate skills like handstand elbow lever is another good one. Any kind of hand balancing, it's fantastic. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Uh, the, uh, the flair, as you put it, you know, it's, I think a lot of us are getting more influenced, uh, ironically enough, being on YouTube and Instagram and everything here, the two of us. But of course, the stuff you scroll through, like I, I don't even follow most calisthenics guys on mm -hmm. social media anymore because they know, of course, the algorithms of social media are to promote whatever gets more attention and likes and more uh, eyeballs. And that's mm -hmm. typically flair. So a lot of the calisthenics guys out there are just flare, 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 flare. And it's really, really bringing up this idea of this is what calisthenics is. And yet in my world, especially, it's like, no, I work at a calisthenics gym and we don't ever do hardly any of that stuff. Yeah, yeah that's the difference between being a personal, a professional personal trainer and someone who's just creating on social media, right? They're going for the views, but you're going for reality. And I, I totally know what you're talking about. I have never had someone, because I, I offer coaching via my website, I never had someone, you know, say, I want to learn front lever or planche or anything like that. They've never paid me to teach them that. It's always more basic. And it's always usually starting from, you know, kind of square one. And they, they want to master the fundamentals or they have a goal, like they want to lose weight. You know, they want to build muscle, things like that. Yeah. So, I think there's also this, the allure of the extreme in fitness where again social media is all extreme and it's all the the very fancy flary stuff and things but you know my uh boss over at the bodyweight gym is like look dude like most people if they could do a decent set of lunges push-ups and pull-ups or rows it's like that's most of what most people are going to need in their fitness to get the bulk of what they want out of this stuff. Like that's all they really not. It's not a limiting approach, but I think a lot of us are getting distracted by the fancy stuff 
And as a result, we're struggling with it. We're getting injured from it too much. It's just, yes. that's too much of what we're focusing on. And the quote, boring stuff is actually what's going to get us the best re returns yes. on our efforts. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, the, the return on investment is way up for those basics, right? And the risk of injury is low. But the more you get towards front lever, side lever, planche and stuff, it, it switches, right? Now your return on investment is lower and your risk of injury is higher. Yep, so, yep. Mm -hmm. And totally just to be clear to those listening, you know, we're not discouraging the pursuit of these things. It's just, where is the attention? Where are you putting your efforts? It's mm -hmm. all, everything in life, especially in fitness is about where are you spending your attention? And I feel like, especially with the internet these days, there's this inverse relationship trying to get you to put your attention to things that really aren't that worthwhile or important. And it's pulling attention away from the things that are. So in that line of things, we were talking about exercise, going back to nutrition, what would you say are some of the quote basics things that take uh, the most or have the best in return on investment? Oh, best ROI for nutrition. Yeah, okay. yeah, basically what I'm trying to say. Really, yeah. there's a lot of um, way to get to that question. Yeah, it's it's um it's a tough question because nutrition is such a touchy subject for people. And whenever I, I bring this up on my channel, I often get the carnivore dieters and the keto dieters chime in and, and try to prove me wrong. But, um, you know, in my experience and according to science, what I have seen is that we as humans are omnivores, right? And we, but we come from primates. We come from, you know, we're hominids. And if you look at anthropology, um, we actually shared a common ancestor with these uh, bonobos, they're, they're primates. So I took a good look at what bonobos eat, what chimpanzees eat, and the vast majority of their diet is raw fruits and vegetation. And they do eat some meat, some eggs out of birds' nests and things like that, but the vast majority is fruits and vegetables. And uh, the best ROI, believe it or not for me, has been raw fruits and vegetables. The more I include of those in my diet, the better I feel. And I do slack on it, especially in the winter. I live near Chicago here in, in Illinois. And in the winter, it's really hard to get something besides, you know, the standard bananas and apples and stuff. So I totally get it. But now that it's summer, I'm eating lots of watermelon, you know, tons of different greens, green leafy vegetables are really important. So just including as much raw fruits and vegetables in your diet, I think is the, the most important thing anyone can do, mm -hmm. no, no matter what kind of diet they eat. Yeah, I, I fully, fully agree. Um, there, was, there was, I forget where I heard this years ago, and I'm, I'm probably way over generalizing on this one, but uh, there was a nutritionist who was basically saying, look, if you can get roughly 50% of your diet to be plant-based, He's like, you're going to be way healthier than the majority of people. If you can just get even to that 50% mark, hey, I think what it actually, if I recall, he did a study, he was kind of doing this uh, anecdotal observational study over 10 years, and he's just going all over the world. He's like, everyone on the planet Earth, like, who's the healthiest? Who, who has the best performance? And he found that with almost no exception, he's like, if you can just get roughly half of your diet plants. He's like, I don't care what the rest of your diet really is comprised of. I mean, not obviously candy bars and junk food, but he's like, if you can just, and the whole point is get good amounts of plants in your diet. And that's probably going to be the biggest return on investment uh, that you can do. And especially here in the Western world, it, it's kind of scary. I'll ask people like, so what, when are you getting vegetables? When are you getting plant-based foods and stuff? And they're like, well, I'll have a vegetable at dinner yep. and that's it. Like they'll, they'll have some peas with dinner or something. And it's like, okay, not, it's better than nothing, I guess. But wow, it, when you take that and you're like, yeah, I've got something plant-based for each meal, you know, a good plant-based food for each meal and stuff. That is a huge, huge difference in the nutritional quality, the satisfaction, your fiber intake, your phytochemicals. I mean, it's just everything's going way, way, way up. And it's really not that hard when you just look at a list of what are plant-based out there. There's a lot of options out there. It's not just apples and broccoli. Right. Yeah. There's a, a wide variety. 
I wonder if the study you're talking about is, um, was it the Blue Zone study? There's a guy named Dan Butner who traveled the world and he looked for all the longest living cultures and uh, I think there's five of them, five blue zones, might be seven now that yeah. they've added some, but yeah. he found the same thing. He found that, you know, they were predominantly plant-based and they also all shared in common that they ate uh, legumes, lots of beans and lentils. So mm -hmm. I do try to include that in my diet almost every day. Um, but yeah, I, I'd say focus on those raw fruits and veggies, especially raw. There's this unique benefit you get from raw food where it's very hydrating, you know, because the fruits and vegetables have water in them and it's structured water. Your body absorbs that much faster and easier than like if you just chug a, a glass of water. So, um, you know, and there's other things, like I mentioned earlier, limiting your caffeine and alcohol because those are dehydrating. So you want to make sure you, you do that if you're going to be trying to hydrate with fruits and vegetables. Um, but yeah, you know, another big step I would say is uh, intermittent fasting. I'm a huge fan of that. And I personally have noticed the benefits because I used to eat, I was one of those people where like, I'd wake up in the morning and just eat out of habit. I would have breakfast and I'm like, well, why, if I'm not hungry, why am I eating? So working out fasted, I think is great. And, uh, you know, making your first meal after your workout. And I typically eat in like a eight hour window, you know, somewhere around, you know, around lunchtime to dinner time, like a, like an eight hour window or so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. And again, a, a return on investment uh, right there. You know, I, mm -hmm. I've long talked about that. It's like, dude, it's, you don't need to track anything. You don't need like a lot of like complicated formulas. It's like, I don't eat breakfast. Like that's all there is to it kind of thing. Yeah. Or I don't eat dinner or something like kind of idea. And it's especially when you're looking to cut out calories and stuff, it's one of the easiest ways to go about it because it's just that it's all yep. it is. It's like, yeah, I, I'm just not having dinner tonight. There you go. Yeah. It's, you know, it, it takes some effort, of course, but when you look at a lot of other approaches out there that are way overcomplicated and resource intensive and stuff, things like that are just very relatively low effort or investment, but mm -hmm. man, they can be a powerful influence when applied in the right way. Yep. And uh, another thing they found in, in research is that when you do intermittent fasting, when you have that longer fasting window of like 16 hours or more, uh, your body starts sort of cleaning up, right? So your arteries, if there's any damage to the arteries, which is a huge thing with the plant-based diet, um, your arteries, the innermost lining of the arteries is called the endothelium, and it produces nitric oxide gas to help your blood travel easier through the arteries and, and veins. So if there's damage in there, then you don't get as much nitric oxide and then your blood will travel slower and then your blood pressure can go up. The heart has to try harder. So um, aside from like certain plant-based foods helping your endothelium, fasting really helps it because that's an opportunity when you're not digesting food for your body to clean house, to start healing the endothelium. So that's really huge too for people who might um, you know, have a history of, of heart disease in their family or something just skipping breakfast or dinner, whatever meal you prefer, it can have a big impact. Lunch too. I, I've known several um, oh, yeah. Yeah. hard charging entrepreneurs and they're like, dude, just not having to take that lunch break in the middle of the day, disrupting my workflow and my momentum. And I could take a meeting at that time and stuff. I find a lot of busy people in the day love just not having that lunch break. And especially if they get off work relatively early, like 4.30 or so, and then they have a relatively early dinner, but yeah. like it's, it's, it's uh, much easier on their schedule. Yeah, I was doing that for a while. I, I think it's called too mad, but I was having just two meals a day, like a, a brunch kind of thing, like a late <laughs> breakfast and then dinner. And I felt great. You know, it's just as long as your body has that time between meals to, to not be digesting. Yeah. I think, I think what we're saying here is don't overthink this stuff. Like there's so many ways we can approach this thing. And this is one of the things I love about your approaches is you have a direction to head into and in general approaches, but it's not so dogmatic that you're like, you have to do it this way kind of thing. It's like, there's lots of freedom and independence from what you uh, recommend that uh, people practice. And that gives them the ability to explore their own paths and methods with just some guidance, but not necessarily, you know, marching orders. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. So tell us more about your app. What is what is this app that you have? And what are the programs? What what does it do? What kind of uh, workouts are for people there? 
So yeah, my app is made by a company called Tribe and um, it's great. It's it's a follow along like set by set, rep by rep uh, workout app. So right on your phone, it just tells you, you know, like you have a list of all the exercises that are gonna be in that workout and uh, you get going and you follow along with what's on the screen and there's rest timers and everything. Um, I have three programs in there currently. Uh, one is a beginner program with no equipment. Another is a strength building program that requires a pull-up bar and a dip station. And a third program, which is handstand, going from complete beginner to a, a full handstand. Uh, and I'm actually working at the moment on adding, I have five more programs that I'm working on. I'm just gonna put them all in there at once. So, Wonderful, fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, and we'll have links down below, of course, is in the description or on the uh, website, uh, reddeltaproject.com, to everything that Ryan has, uh, his workouts, his website, uh, his socials, everything. So you, if you're learning more, if this is jiving with you, please do uh, check out his stuff. YouTube videos are fantastic, very informative, very practical information, and it's well worth your time, dear listener, to check out Ryan's stuff, which is why I brought him on. It was like, more people need to know about this guy. I think he can really help a lot of folks out. So to play us out here, what is the best piece of advice that you would give somebody, not just necessarily beginner, but let's say someone's got about three to five years of experience, or they're getting a little long in the tooth and getting a little bit tired of the usual grind and the fitness and stuff. Where would you start to direct their attention to get the ball rolling again and start seeing more results? Hmm. That's a good question. I would have to say, um, don't be afraid to be a jack of all trades and don't be afraid to be a beginner at things. You know, there's so many different modalities of fitness, even in the body weight realm. And it can be really fun to be a beginner again. So if you feel like you've kind of stalled out, maybe you're plateaued and you're just not seeing the progress you want to see. Well, have you tried primal movement? Have you tried yoga? Have you, you know, there's gymnastics, um, hand balancing. There's so many different things you can do. And although you'll be a beginner again, which is, you know, sounds a bit scary. It's actually fun. I love that. And some people have criti they've criticized me on YouTube saying like, oh, you do so many things. I'm like, well, I love it. I, I love being a jack of all trades. You know, I'm, I'm not a master of anything. I just love exploring and I just bring the audience with me. So yeah, I encourage people to do that. If you feel bored, explore, be curious, be a beginner. Outstanding. I love yeah. it. I love it. So everybody, again, check out Ryan's stuff down below. All of it is fantastic. Please do let me know if you have questions, of course, in the comments, if you're watching this on YouTube or reddeltaproject at gmail.com. Ryan's information is down below. If you want to get in touch with him, check out his app and his YouTube and the socials and everything else. Thank you so much, very much for coming on, Ryan. I really do appreciate your time and energy. And I look forward to seeing a lot more from what's coming down the pipe. Anything new you're working on besides those five programs you can kind of clue us in on? Uh, well, there's um, the rep method, which is going to be my full course in fitness. So calisthenics and plant-based eating, but that's still a ways off. I'm thinking around the new year, probably. Fantastic. So, and you yeah. have actually a sign up on your website to let people know when that comes out. I've signed up for it because I want to be alerted when that comes out. So uh, you can go onto his website, everybody, and get an alert on your email for that when it uh, gets released as well. So, all right. Thank you so much, Ryan. I do appreciate it. And thank you, dear listener, for listening. As always, I'll talk to you next time. Till then, be fit and live free.